You're watching BBC World News with me, Tim Wilcox. On today's Global, Ukraine on high alert on the eve of Independence Day, six months after Russia invaded. There's heavy security on the streets of Kyiv, mass celebrations are banned, and the US orders all its citizens still in Ukraine to leave. With fighting continuing near Europe's biggest nuclear power plant, independent inspectors are trying to organise an urgent visit to the site at Zaporizhia. But despite the war and bloodshed, a morale boost for the country's citizens as football returns for the first time since February. Later in Global, one of the world's biggest financial scandals is, sees Najib Razak, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, jailed. He's sent to prison for 12 years after losing a final appeal. We talk live to one of the journalists who broke the 1MDB scandal. And Jupiter as you've never seen it before. Stunning new images from NASA's James Webb Telescope. Hello and welcome to Global. Deep into its bloody war with Russia, Ukraine is marking two of its most important national moments this week. Today is the country's flag day, based on centuries-old history of Ukrainian statehood. Tomorrow is Ukraine's Independence Day, which celebrates its decision to break away from the former Soviet Union and, symbolically, the day Vladimir Putin chose to invade exactly six months ago. But unlike previous years, there will be no mass gatherings and public celebrations in Kyiv and elsewhere, as Ukraine braces itself for more attacks, possibly on civilian targets. The US Embassy has told all its citizens in the country to leave immediately, and the mood on the streets is apprehensive. I will be demanding that I have opportunities to discuss with staff, with all staff present there. And we have, of course, the vast majority is the, is the Ukrainian operators from the plant, uh, but there are also Russian experts there. So I will be talking to, to, to everybody and trying to, to uh, ascertain the, the, the situation and make uh, the necessary recommendations. For, from my perspective, as the international organization dealing with among other things, the security and the safety of these installations. What we are going to be uh, making sure is that there is absolute clarity on what has happened, first, this is very important, and secondly, to uh, indicate what should not happen. We are going to try to establish a presence there. Um, my conviction is that having the IAEA on site will have a stabilizing effect. Well, that was uh, Rafael Moriano uh, Grossi, the head of the IAEA, in an interview with our Kiev correspondent James Wardhouse, just talking about uh, the chances of getting a visit to that Zaporizhia plant where more fighting uh, has been taking place today. Uh, we'll have more with our correspondent James Wardhouse in a few minutes' time. Uh, but despite the fear and apprehension of what might be to come, the Ukrainian Premier League football season resumed today, supported by President Zelensky as a morale boost for the country's citizens. And the first time Ukraine has seen football since the war broke out during the winter break. Games are being played behind closed doors in Kyiv and in the west of the country. Every stadium has bomb shelters no further than 500 metres away. The goal is to restore some sense of normal life during the war. Well, a few hours ago, the opening match between uh, Shakhtar Donetsk and Metalis 1925 from Kharkiv took place in the Olympic Stadium. Both teams are from eastern cities that are fighting for their very existence. The match ended goalless. Shakhtar Donetsk were top of the table before the season was abandoned, but since then many of their foreign star names, mostly Brazilian, have left. Their coach spoke before the match of the importance of the football season. We see this as a sign of professionalism and a big responsibility to show the world that life in Ukraine hasn't stopped, that it still goes on. Football is an emotional thing for the whole of Ukraine and it connects to those who are fighting for us. So it means a lot to each one of us as individuals and as a team, not just for Shakhtar, but for Ukraine's Premier League as well. We can show the world that football is still going on. 
Yes, it's hard, and maybe the need to fight is more important. Well, with me now is Nigel Adderley, a sports reporter with BBC World Service, who has been following the match. Shame it was goalless, but I suppose the symbolism of this is quite extraordinary, isn't it? The first football since February, something to give hope and meaning, President Zelensky was saying, uh, for those people who are fighting in the war. Yes, it was a very tepid game, two very rusty teams, understandably, but as you say, it was heavy with symbolism and I think it was an attempt for Ukraine to say there is a sense of normality here, despite all of the tension currently on the streets you were talking about earlier on. This has been uh, something driven by the president himself and he was uh, front and centre today in the pre-match ceremony. A, a recorded address from him boomed out across the, the empty stadium and while... There are no fans, there are plenty of military in the stadium and bomb shelters are, are, are very close at hand. I think this is a sense that football is back and, and people, in a small way, will have something to enjoy. Uh, huge support for football in Ukraine, as we know, but presumably some of those teams, Mariupol, for example, which is taken by Russia, uh, don't play anymore. No, Mariupol are one of two teams who have been taken out of the Ukrainian Premier League at the moment, and that's understandable when you consider what has happened to that city. And all of the games at the moment are taking place in the capital, Kyiv. The opening game today was in the Olympic Stadium and other venues in the West. Now, for Shakhtar Donetsk, they're used to playing away from home, but they've been out of their city since the Russian-backed separatists uh, took over back in 2014. So they're, they're used to life on the road, and that's something that the, the other teams will have to become used to as well. But I think there is a sense at the moment of everybody bonding together to make the best of this. There were no fans in the stadium, there was no atmosphere, and that impacted on the game we saw earlier on today. But the main thing is... The game is on, and I think that many people are very happy about that. Uh, but a lot of foreign stars who played in Ukraine for, for Ukrainian sides have, have gone. No, Shakhtar Donetsk were known for the Brazilian talent they had over many, many years. They were bankrolled significantly, had a good deal of success both in Ukraine and in European football as well. But those names were all given the opportunity to move on from Ukraine on free transfers when the war started. They did sign one Brazilian player who made his debut today, which I think was, was harking back to the way the club used to be. But this is an opportunity now for, for young players in Ukraine. A number of the teams are having to rebuild their squads with young, homegrown players. And, of course... Some of whom will be fighting. Yeah, many of the players are coming back from active service as well, or, or, on the front line. And, and a small number of players were killed in the early weeks of the, of the war. That was recognised by a moment's silence before the game today as well. The, the match was kicked off by a member of the armed services. So while many people are saying it is great, we have some sort of football back, its return today was really tinged with sadness. OK, Nigel, thank you very much indeed. Uh, right, we can go to Kiev now and speak to our correspondent there, James Waterhouse. Uh, James, I want to come to the atmosphere in Kiev at the moment on Flag Day, normally celebrated by thousands of people, and Independence Day, of course, hugely symbolic tomorrow, uh, six months to the day since Russia invaded. But first of all, I know you've been speaking to uh, Rafael Mariano Grossi, uh, the head of the IAEA, because only a few days ago, Vladimir Putin said that this, the biggest power plant in Europe, Zaporizhia, uh, he would allow IAEA inspectors to go as soon as possible, but he didn't specify when. Uh, what did Mr Grossi have to say? Yes, you're right. I think ever since the Kremlin announced it would help inspectors in, it was always going to be about the detail. Mr Grossi said, uh, while not giving an exact date, he said he hoped to be in within days, not weeks. And he said he hoped to personally lead a mission in. Now, one of the sticking points is how those inspectors will be let in. Would it be through Ukrainian territory or territory which Russia currently occupies? He wouldn't be drawn on that, saying the situation's so urgent, it doesn't matter about geography, we just need to get in. He then listed seven areas, seven so-called red lines, which he wanted to look at, including external power supply, so the reactors could properly cool. There's been concerns uh, that it's occasionally been getting cut off as the Russians look to transfer power to the Crimean grid. Uh, it would also, he said, he also wants to speak to staff, staff who have described to the BBC of facing the daily threat of kidnap, effectively being kept at gunpoint. Uh, I challenged him and said, would you uh, 
do you think they'd speak to you freely? And he said, yes, I would demand it. So the virtue of Mr Grossi and the United Nations nuclear watchdog is that he doesn't represent a military force or a country. Therefore, it's probably this is what's brought him this close to access. But he acknowledges the limitations of this inspection. He can only recommend and report based on his findings. And he wants to establish a more permanent presence there, but he can't control the very, pro the very likelihood of fighting breaking out in the area almost immediately uh, after that visit, if or when it happens. OK, uh, and just turning to today, Flag Day, uh, and tomorrow, Independence Day, six months to the day that Russia invaded. What is the mood in Kyiv at the moment? Because all mass, dem all mass celebrations have been banned, haven't they? How apprehensive are people? It, you, you certainly get a feel of, of nervousness. Over the years, you, uh, Kyiv certainly has either staged parades or certain processions, if you like, markings of, of this significant moment in, in, in Ukraine's calendar. Now there are bans on public gatherings. If you walk around, restaurants and bars are closing a little bit earlier. Uh, and along the main street uh, through the city, there are deposited, captured or destroyed Russian tanks from early on in the invasion. This time last year, it was where Ukrainian armoured vehicles would drive through in what would be a show of strength. That strength, as we speak, is facing the ultimate test. So it's more of a story of stark contrast and cautiousness, not least because of the warnings from the US State Department that they fear a step up in Russian attacks on government buildings infrastructure. That said, the city's air defence systems work pretty well these days. We haven't seen the type of high-profile strikes which the US warn of, nevertheless, it's going to be a pretty quiet three days. Yeah, and what sort of intelligence are they getting about an escalation of Russian tactics? I'm thinking also, of course, about the, the, the killing and that car uh, bomb of uh, Daria Dugina uh, in Moscow at the weekend. They haven't elaborated overly. We've heard intelligence reports this week of increased Russian mo troop movement in Belarus, Russia's ally to the north, an increase in movement to firing positions. This is, of course, a country where Russia staged its initial invasion and where it subsequently st staged longer-range airstrikes. But I think you're right to point out the instability of this war currently. We've had the killing of the daughter of a prominent Russian propagandist. We've seen long-held Crimea targeted in longer-range attacks, seemingly from Ukraine. And then we also have Ukrainian Independence Day, a time in the past, which Russia has used to increase its operations over the past eight years of its current aggression. So I think all of those fed together are making the West pretty nervous about the next few days. But for a lot of people, it's nothing out of the ordinary, particularly given what this country has gone through over the past six months. James Waterhouse in Kiev. Thank you. Najib Razak, the former Malaysian Prime Minister convicted of money laundering linked to the 1MDB embezzlement scandal, has lost his final bid to overturn his 12-year prison sentence and has been sent to jail. The massive embezzlement of billions of dollars from the 1MDB state fund was one of the world's biggest financial scandals and reverberated from Malaysia and Singapore to Wall Street and beyond. Najib, who is 69, fell from power in its aftermath, with his prosecution seen as a test of Malaysia's and the region's judicial system when dealing with senior political figures. Our Southeast Asia editor, Jonathan Head, has more. He was once the most powerful man in the country. Untouchable, even. But Najib Razak arrived for the final stage of his appeal, knowing that the odds were now against him. Every attempt to overturn or even delay the 12-year prison sentence he'd been given thwarted by a judiciary which stood firm behind the original verdict. I will not get a judgment based on the principles of fair trial. I did not get it. The son of a former prime minister, he was groomed for power and held office for nine years in a country where the ruling party had never lost an election. 
Stories of spectacular greed and corruption brought thousands out onto the streets in protest. But investigations into huge losses from the state-run investment fund known as 1MDB went nowhere. The Department of Justice has filed a civil complaint seeking to forfeit and recover more than $1 billion in assets associated with an international conspiracy to launder funds stolen from one Malaysia development barad, or 1MDB. Even when the United States launched its own investigation, Mr Najib looked secure in a country where power has rarely been accountable. But at the last election four years ago, an opposition coalition led by Malaysia's most renowned political figure, Mahathir Mohamed, once Mr Najib's ally, rode the public yearning for change to an unexpected and historic victory. Mr Najib, seemingly in shock as he accepted the verdict of the people, was untouchable no longer. His home was raided. More than 200 top-priced designer handbags, still in their boxes, were among the many luxury items seized. I think this is the biggest seizure in uh, Malaysian history. And multiple criminal charges soon followed. For those who've dreamed of a cleaner politics in Malaysia, this is surely a moment to savour. But Najib Razak remains wealthy, influential and popular in some parts of Malaysian society. It's probably too soon yet to write off his political career. Jonathan Head, BBC News, Bangkok. Well, Claire Rucastle-Brown is a British investigative journalist, also the editor of Sarawak Report, an online anti-corruption website that investigated 1MDB scandal extensively. She joins us from central London. Thank you for joining us here on BBC News. Uh, I mean, it's been a long, drawn-out case, hasn't it? He was convicted two years ago. This was an appeal. Uh, I was just reading about some of the blocking tactics from his legal team, even his solicitor one day, saying that his, his wrist was sprained from taking his dog for a walk, which meant they had to delay it for another uh, month or two. So how surprised are you to see him go down today? Well, I had a fairly sleepless night trying to keep abreast of, of the sort of daytime uh, trial activities um, in Kuala Lumpur. And I have to say, right up to the last minute, uh, most people were, were still couldn't really believe that uh, the final uh, you know, hit of the gavel would come down on, on Najib. But um, as you describe it, it, it really had descended into farcical delay by the end. He'd managed using all the power and wealth and influence that uh, your report um, so well described. He had managed really to hold off um, this, this moment for, for years um, with, with all these tactics. Um, and yet today, I think uh, we had a situation where he'd stirred up so much, he'd, he'd sort of in a Trumpian way politicised all of this. He'd attacked the judges, he'd attacked, accused the chief justice and the original judge of being corrupt and conflicted. Uh, it was becoming nasty, um, it had become farcical, and I think um, everyone really in Malaysia knew this had to had to stop. And, and so almost, uh, you know, terribly unexpectedly today, the, the appeal court just said enough's enough. We've, we've Seen, we've seen all the evidence and there's really no more um, room for delay. Yeah, I think the, the, the line was there's, there's no merit in the arguments being put forward. But is this the start, though, of much more litigation and many more people facing justice now? Well, um, this is just the first of several uh, sets of charges that Najib Razak is facing. Um, in fact, it's, it's perhaps the least of the uh, crimes uh, that he's been uh, charged with that are going through the courts. So um, things are not looking good for Najib unless he manages to use his influence to get a pardon with the king, which I think they'll be hesitating to do. His own Omno party, I think, had decided that they had, you know, they didn't really want to be tarred with all this any longer. And, and that's why there was so little interference in the course of justice. Um, there are other senior politicians around Najib. He presided over a huge uh, endemic corruption that had developed within his political party in Malaysia. And yes, uh, several others are now looking um, at uh, following him into jail. I want to come to the importance this means now for Malaysia. But just before that, just, just talk us through a little bit about your uh, investigations. What, many, many years ago now, uh, you were born, I think, 
in Sarawak, weren't you, in Borneo, and you were investigating something else, weren't you? I think deforestation before you came across what seemed to be this huge embezzlement. Well, yes, I mean, so much of what is going wrong in countries like Malaysia is, is driven by poor governance, which is uh, caused by corruption generally. Um, and as I started to sort of try and stand up for the indigenous people in the in the area that I've been brought up in, East Malaysia, um, and to, to, to try and counter this senseless, insane deforestation uh, for palm oil plantations uh, that, was, that was going on, I started to, to cotton on to just how this was all just about money going into a handful of pockets. And as I looked into the corruption situation in Malaysia, I, I, I started to cotton on to this one particular story, which was 1MDB. And, and as I started shaking the tree and, um, and asking around, I, I, I started to develop sources. Um, and um, eventually was able to pick up the phone actually to the FBI and DOJ in America and say, I've got a few hundred million that have been laundered through your country. Are you interested? You talk about it in a very matter of fact, almost nonchalant way, because I mean, you weren't working for a big title, were you like a big newspaper or a, a news organization? Uh, what sort of what sort of blocks, confrontation, threats did you encounter? Because you are talking about very senior political figures and their relations, uh, washing, taking hundreds of millions of dollars, some of it ending up in a, in a, in a Hollywood film, The Wolf of Wall Street. Yes, it's funny they chose a film about um, insane <laughs> success. Um, yes, uh, well, I, I was one of a, a number of journalists who've um, had the experience of what it's like to be a target of um, state actors. Um, yes, because I was working on my own on, on this project, that was one of the reasons why I was able to devote the time that was necessary to unearth so much uh, information. Um, but um, at the same time, they saw me as a, you know, if they could just get rid of me, as it were, <laughs> which they tried to do in numerous ways, um, then then they could close the story down. So so for a while, I, I was quite um, I was in quite a tricky situation um, with with uh, you know lawyers and um, PR campaigns and and sometimes worse um, threatening me. Okay. Um, but luckily, you know, just, the, just, the, just the a final thought, Claire. I mean, I'm sorry because we're running out of time. But just I wanted to broaden it a little bit. I mean, how important is this sentencing for Malaysia and the wider region as well when it comes to holding? very senior political figures to account. I think this is a massive step forward for Malaysia. Um, it's shown the country that the rule of law can prevail over power. Um, and that's not how it's been. Um, right up till last night, Najib's people were driving up to the prime minister's house and telling him he had to intervene in the judicial process. Um, and uh, to, to his credit, he, he didn't. I mean, he probably had his own political motives um, for that. But um, the rule of law has prevailed in Malaysia, and that's a very good thing for its future. I think everybody feels that. Claire Rukasa-Brown, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us here on BBC News. Now, large swathes of Portugal are facing an extreme risk of fire due to drought and heat. The official warning comes as firefighters continue to battle a blaze in the central northern Vila Real region. Uh, let's speak now to Rodrigo Sá, Director of Communications for the Vila Real Municipality in Portugal. H how bad is it at the moment? Um, hi there. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, it has been bad since Sunday. It has been a big, big fire. Uh, we have been fighting it um, in this moment. Most of it is, uh, is, has been put out, but uh, we are still fighting. Uh, how many hectares, uh, acres uh, are, have burned so far and what sort of help are you getting? Because I think a lot of your firefighters are volunteers when it comes to situations like this. Uh, so far, uh, almost uh, uh, 6,000 uh, hectares have been have burned. Uh, right now, we have more than 300 men on the ground. We have five, uh, five planes. We have almost 100 vehicles um, fighting the fire. Uh, and yes, most of our men are volunteers. Uh, well, when I say volunteers, they are well trained, they are well equipped. Uh, but they are people that have other uh, other jobs uh, besides being firemen. But of course, they are also with the teams of professional professional teams, so firefighters, uh, local and regional. I, I was struck by the fact that um, for uh, culturally in Portugal, farmers, shepherds still burn 
land, don't they? They burn their uh, their their, their terroir, their, their territory uh, to to get rid of uh, to get rid of uh, uh, brush and things like that. Is that a cultural problem mm -hmm. that you are encountering at the moment? Uh, it is. It is an old problem. Uh, the question is that uh, the shepherds used to do it in the old days. Uh, to promote the, 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 the new sprouting, the, the, the new plants to feed the cattle. But nowadays, since we have less population and we have less farming, uh, mainly in the, in the countryside in Portugal, uh, the truth is that most of the fields are abandoned or, or a good part of the fields are abandoned. And so when the shepherds uh, use the fire, as they have been using for, for centuries, when they use the fire to promote the, the new sprouting, uh, the, the, the fire gets big, uh, gets very, very big. And sometimes, like uh, in this case, um, it, it comes to, to 6,000 hectares. Uh, for instance, today, after yesterday, the fire being completely controlled, uh, today we have, we have been working on a front uh, where about 300 hectares have burned so far. And we believe uh, firmly that it was someone that that started that fire. It was not a natural fire. It was not a, uh, a reignition. It was someone that decided to uh, to start it again. So yes, we have that problem. All right. Okay. Well, uh, Rodrigo Sa, uh, best of luck with uh, the uh, fight ahead uh, as these temperatures remain so high. Uh, that is it yeah. for me. But just before we go, I just want to show you some pictures uh, of the moment a super yacht. Well, actually, not really a super yacht. A 130-foot yacht went down just off the coast of Sicily. Uh, it's not clear who owned this, but uh, spare a thought for the owner. It's worth between 7 and $12 million. Uh, no one died. All the crew and passengers taken off. But as you can see, uh, even a super yacht, when it takes on water, doesn't always uh, have a happy ending. That's it from me and the team. We're back in a minute. See you then. Hello there. A ridge of high pressure continues to bring some high temperatures to parts of Western Europe. So hot weather extending in again across uh, parts of France, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark as well. It's also pretty hot for Lath Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. And across the southeast of Europe, there will be some sunshine, but with an upper area of low pressure here, we are also going to see some thunderstorms. And one or two of those thunderstorms could become quite severe with a risk of some localised flash flooding. So we'll potentially see some of those storms affecting Western Turkey, Greece, Albania, stretching up towards uh, parts of Romania and Hungary as well. Across Spain and Portugal, temperatures a bit closer to the seasonal average, the 35 in Madrid. One or two thunderstorms being kicked off across northern areas of Spain as well. Paris 32 degrees Celsius, so some pretty hot weather here. 33 for Frankfurt. On Thursday, we'll start to see a band of rain moving in off the Atlantic. So that's going to be quite heavy rain as it crosses areas of England, moving into parts of France. Again, parts of Netherlands, Belgium could see some rain arriving late in the day. Here's your outlook over the next few days. Well, that band of rain will be moving into Paris for a time on Friday. That will drop the temperatures down into the mid-20s, but then should be sunnier and warmer as we head into this weekend. Meanwhile, in Kyiv, some hot weather here for the time of year. Temperatures into the low 30s. That's your weather. Now showing on BBC Real. Na lanta tanzia kwenye tatu tatu na hita hivi chere u bulivanti chere u nuhu chere u fukunulu nuhu anti ya vilunzia ke zairu na na u reserva tano sifasi. Tena ni sisi tu kwa vuzi tami uweu na uzima mivali tami zai dar na muhangaze na asasi dima pulis kiluzi hai. Watch more stories like this at bbc.com slash real. It's six months into the war in Ukraine and these Russian armoured vehicles and tanks are displayed in Kyiv as a reminder of the threat this country faces. 
I'm James Waterhouse, and as we see more intense fighting in the South, follow us on BBC World News for all the latest updates in this conflict. Home of Nintendo and the bullet train, but Japan is no longer a pioneer when it comes to innovation. I'm travelling across my home country to meet the next generation of entrepreneurs who are hoping to make this place Asia's Silicon Valley. Join me, Marie Koi, for the New Tech Economy series here on BBC World News. The momentum behind women's sport is at fever pitch after England win the European Football Cup. But are the dollars finally flowing in to level the playing field? I find out from the head of Women's Super League and the boss of US Ski and Snowboard. Join me, Aaron Heselhurst, on Talking Business Weekly here on BBC World News. In our connected world, all news is international. So, for in-depth analysis... The impact on Europe and the rest of the world would be devastating. And correspondents covering both home and global events... Get a deeper understanding and find out what is really going on. BBC World News America. This is BBC World News. I'm Tim Wilcox. On today's Global, Ukraine on high alert on the eve of Independence Day, six months after Russia invaded. There's heavy security on the streets of Kyiv, mass celebrations are banned, and the US orders all of its citizens still in Ukraine to leave. The fighting continuing near Europe's biggest nuclear power plant, independent inspectors are trying to organise an urgent visit to the site at Zaporizhia. We are going to try to establish a presence there. Um, my conviction is that having the IAEA on site will have a stabilising effect. Later in Global Britain, spy agencies stand accused of tipping off Indian authorities, leading to the abduction and alleged torture of a Scottish Sikh man, allegations which India denies. Germany looks to Canada for a helping hand with its energy supplies this winter. Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Justin Trudeau have just signed a new deal. And Jupiter, as you've never seen it before, stunning new images from NASA's James Webb Telescope. Hello and welcome to the programme. Britain's intelligence agencies are facing accusations that they tipped off the Indian authorities about a British man who was later seized and allegedly tortured. Jagtar Singh Johal, a Sikh activist and blogger, was snatched off a street by Indian police five years ago. He's been in prison ever since. India has denied suggestions of torture and says Mr Johal faces very serious charges. His brother has been speaking to the BBC about the circumstances of his abduction. He had to travel to India to get married and he got married. Two weeks after his marriage, he was out shopping with his wife and our cousin. Um, the car was intercepted by unknown men. He was taken out of the car, hooded and bungled into a van and taken away. Since that day, he remains incarcerated. This is November 2017. So the dilemma and the nightmare that's been ongoing is for nearly five years where we've been advocating for Jack's release, uh, pushing on the Indian government to release him, but the UK government have said that they're doing all they can, but they haven't been doing all they can because they failed to first acknowledge that he was arbitrarily detained. Eventually, Boris Johnson has confirmed he's arbitrarily detained and they failed to call for Jack's release. Um, so it's been a nightmare upon a nightmare as the, how the family have been feeling. My kids this morning said, Dad, what's on the news? What's this about the UK government? And I don't have the heart. How do I tell them? They're nine years and 11 years old, telling them that the UK government are failing their uncle. Our security correspondent Frank Gardner has more on the background to the case. Britain's intelligence agencies, of course, share intelligence, sometimes with partner agencies in friendly countries, of which India is one. Um, now, they're not going to comment on this. They didn't make any public comments anyhow. But we did have a statement from Britain's foreign ministry, the Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office, yesterday, saying that because of an ongoing legal case, it would be inappropriate for them to comment. And what they mean is that um, this man, uh, Jagtar Johal, has taken out a claim against the British government 
in the High Court in London, um, accusing them of complicity, of basically sharing information with the Indian authorities that they think, uh, his family think, and Reprieve, the human rights organization think, led to his arrest. Um, now, it's a really murky tale, this, and it's it's very depressing that this is raising its head again, because all of this smacks of the early years of the war on terror, the so-called war on terror, when people were being extraordinarily rendered. Um, Britain had a bad experience with this in prior to 2011, when um, Britain's MI6 intelligence agency was found to have um, assisted in the rendition of somebody called uh, Abdul Karim Belhaj, a Libyan dissident, to Libya, where he was tortured. That has eventually resulted in a full-scale apology with Britain's Attorney General standing up in Parliament saying, we're really sorry, this must never happen again. Now, there are strict rules in place in these agencies. They are not supposed to ever share intelligence with any sister agency in any country if there is a serious risk of torture and maltreatment. Now, it hasn't been proved in an international court of law that he was tortured, but the fact that his case has been raised by both Prime Minister Theresa May and then as recently as April by Prime Minister Boris Johnson when he was in India seeing Prime Minister Narendra Modi. He raised it then. Obviously, they're taking it seriously uh, and they are concerned about his conditions there. Frank Gardner, time for some uh, business news. German cars about to run on air or when? Potentially. Uh, that's a deal that's been looked at in Canada, Tim. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, this is a story of what, what help, heating, hydrogen, all those things. Uh, Germany keen, of course, to reduce its dependence on Russian gas supplies. It's concerned that President Putin could completely shut down gas flows into Europe this winter. And so Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz is in Canada. They've just signed a deal with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to import Canadian uh, Canadian hydrogen even, uh, something that both leaders hailed at a joint press conference as a green energy solution. Uh, take a listen to what they said. It is imperative to drive the green energy transition forward because we must reduce our damp dependencies and because we want to reach our climate goals. Despite immense pressures and some of the most challenging economic and political circumstances imaginable, you are relentlessly defending democracy in Europe and around the world. For that, we say thank you. Merci. Uh, Justin Trudeau there. Well, uh, Germany's scramble to try and save energy has reopened an old and pretty controversial debate. Most of the country's motorways, you may know, famously have no speed limit. But some experts say that slowing drivers down could help save crucial energy. But the idea of closing off the fast lane is proving to be controversial, as Jenny Hill reports. It's practically a national pastime. Indulging a passion for speed, even if it's in miniature. But as Germany hurtles towards winter, an energy crisis looms and calls for a speed limit on its motorways are gaining traction. It doesn't make any sense. With the current petrol prices, no one goes full throttle on the motorway. Everyone's going slower. Trying to save even more energy by imposing rules wouldn't work. A speed limit is long overdue, but in reality you can't go much faster anyway. Germany's motorways are world famous. There is, technically, nothing to stop a driver doing, as one did recently, more than 400 kilometers an hour. But would slowing them down significantly reduce fuel consumption? In the drive to conserve energy, this economist believes every little helps. It could save some 1.5% of the consumption of fuel. Uh, at least if we would limit it, uh, uh, introduce a speed limit for a certain period of time. I think we should be carefully about introducing it forever, eternally, but for a certain time, as long as the crisis prevails, why not? A motorway speed limit would please environmental campaigners and those who worry about safety, although significantly more people die on Germany's rural roads than the Autobahn. 
This debate has been raging on and off for years, and it's extremely contentious. This, after all, is the land of rules and regulations, of bureaucracy. So for many, it's about so much more than the open road. It's about freedom. And for Germany's liberal politicians, that right is sacrosanct, though the rest of the coalition government disagrees. Well, where's the stop then? Um, if you if you say, well, speed limit 130 kilometers per hour, then the next person comes and says, well, it's 100 uh, kilometers per hour would be even better. The next one comes and says, well, 60 would be even better. And the next person comes and says, well, not driving a car at all would be the best. It's a long running and intense debate. But public opinion has now shifted in favor of a limit. Could this be the moment the battle for Germany's motorways is finally won? Jenny Hill, BBC News, Berlin. Well, uh, let's take some tech news now because Apple planning to start making its new iPhone 14 in India. It is going to ramp up production in the country, according to reports. Now, that's because the tech giant might want to reduce its reliance on China after lockdowns there disrupted production and as political tensions with Washington intensify. Uh, let's speak to Michelle Fleury, who's in New York. Uh, Michelle, this is quite a significant change. It's not moving everything to India, but nonetheless, it's the start of a process of moving some of that crucial production away from China. So here's the thing, Ben. Apple doesn't make its own products. It relies on outside manufacturers. And it's been working and talking for a while now with its partners about reducing its dependence on China because about 90 percent or more of its products are made in China. And what we've seen with the pandemic is obviously harsh lockdowns have disrupted supply chains, add to that geopolitical tensions. Uh, and you can see uh, that the tech giant is now trying to diversify. But the problem is when you're talking about complex sort of machinery being made, in addition, the kind of secrecy that Apple likes around its products, uh, particularly the upcoming iPhone 14 that's going to be launched uh, in September, uh, that's sort of why it kind of takes a long time. So it's going to increase its production in India. Part of the phone will be made in China and then it will be assembled in India. But long term, it's looking to sort of increase that production outside of China uh, and in various other countries. But again, finding the workforce and managing the secrecy that really has been the challenge for this company. Yes, and another company that's never far from the headlines at the moment is Twitter and its share price under pressure again. Uh, just to explain what's going on here, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, I'm just looking at share price down now 5%. All of this after a whistleblower and uh, someone who's known as something of a legendary hacker, Peter Mudzatko. Uh, he has come out with explosive claims saying that Twitter has uh, been negligent when it comes to security. It has misled federal regulators about its safety and it has... Uh, again, been misleading when it comes to the number of bots on its platform. Now, these allegations were made in a whistleblowing document with uh, authorities in the United States, and it could have huge consequences, even including federal fines, if these are proven to be true. Uh, at a time when Twitter is engaged with a legal battle with the CEO of Tesla, Elon Musk, who wants to back out of his bid to buy Twitter. It's worth noting that the CEO of Twitter, Parag Agrawal, has said that Zatko's claims about Twitter are a false narrative. He said they are presented without important context. And Twitter has been at pains to point out that Zatko was fired earlier this year for ineffective leadership and poor performance. Nonetheless, of course, the timing of all of this ahead of this trial between Elon Musk uh, and Twitter in October, obviously raising lots of eyebrows. It is a bit like a soap opera sometimes, isn't it, Michelle? Uh, thank you for running us through all the ins and outs, the twists and turns of uh, what is going on as far as Twitter is concerned. Uh, you're up to date with all the global business headlines. Uh, Tim, back to you. Oh, you got my name right. Uh, <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. On, on all security, it said Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew is never far from this programme, whether he's here or not. Ben, <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, still to come here on Global. England Test Cricket Captain Ben Stokes opens up about his mental health struggles in a new documentary. <laughs>
I'm very interested in the connection between people and I love the fact that people see that in the book.